on middle school debate curriculum and debate across the curriculum. Uh, and just a little bit about ourselves. And um, I currently teach at Pace Academy, uh, and I'm the coach for the middle school. The, for the middle school, so I, I work in the middle school, and I'm the upper school assistant. Um, and I've been in debate for a very, very long time. <laughs> um, I'm the head coach at uh, Science Park High School. Uh, we usually call ourselves North Science um, in Newark, New Jersey. And uh, I've actually just started teaching middle school debate uh, two years ago. I've been coaching for 24 years, uh, but I only started teaching middle school at all uh, in the last two years. Um, I think the, 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 I, was, I was really happy to teach middle school debate, and I was really happy to, um, because when we talk about middle school debate and debate across the curriculum, um, it's part of the same justification, right? right. Because, uh, and also, I want this to be a, a conversation. Uh, we want this to be a conversation. So if you if you have a question in the middle of us speaking, or you have a question about what we're saying, or you want something to add, then please do. Because like we're all in this room, we're all debate coaches, experts, teachers. We've been in the education game for quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of knowledge and experience that's here. Uh, I'm just starting to teach middle school debate, and what I'm teaching and how I'm teaching it is evolving. Um, we're also going to get into how we interact with our staff uh, for various subjects, um, whether it's English, history, uh, even science, and we'll go more into that um, in terms of how the, this and debate across the curriculum uh, function. Right. And so I wanted to pick back on that. I think that it was, I think it's very interesting that Jonathan and I were talking about this, is why almost like a justification for trying to start debate in the middle school because as I was saying in the last presentation, middle schoolers want to debate. You don't have to convince them that it's cool. You don't have to do any of that. You just go, it's debate. You get to argue back and forth and we're going to teach you, we're going to teach you some rules of combat. And they go, yes. And I think that I think a lot of times in high school, we're working against the cool factor, we're working against a lot of those things. And I, and I think it is especially important for young women. Um, it, it's just that uh, because, again, anything you read about girls is that middle school is when they have that crisis in confidence. And having uh, middle school debate is a structured opportunity for them to express themselves, talk about it, and get validated, right? I mean, quite literally, you go to a middle school tournament, uh, they, somebody says, hey, you were great, here's a medal. Uh, I think that that is a huge deal uh, for them, and I think it's such an important part of the curriculum. And um, you know, even in places where they may not go into a high school program, per se, I think that trying to get people, go back home to get people to do middle school debate is really, really important. And I would not have thought about this um, if I hadn't really sat down and had to start working with middle schoolers every day. And actually, that's a good segue into uh, the video. Uh, a organization, uh, really it's a, a television program locally in New Jersey. Um, it's, a, it's, an uh, it's called Classroom Close-Up. Uh, they do, uh, they, they focus on various educational things that go on within New Jersey, and they focused on debate. Um, but it was, most of it is about the teaching of middle school debate. Uh, the first part of the video, uh, we don't see that, the first part of the video talks about like the history of the Science Park High School program, but the whole point of the five minute video was simply to talk about why, why it started to be taught uh, in the middle school level at Science Park High School. Science Park High School is a school that goes from the, uh, from the seventh grade to the twelfth grade, uh, and a huge shout out to my middle school students who are wonderful to teach. They are absolutely awesome. They're smart. They're fun. They're funny. Um, like I really enjoy teaching them. So, uh, so I know this is being uh, being streamed. So, all my middle school kids, uh, you're awesome. It's an honor and fun to teach you always, um, and I learn a lot from them. But this is uh, this is just um, a why we started teaching uh, middle school debate and why, why it became a part of what the principal actually came to me and talked to me about. Uh, the, the former principal of the school um, thought he'd have to talk me into teaching high school, a middle school debate. And he was literally selling me on the idea 
uh, and it was going to, uh, and I'll, I'll play the video and then I'll tell you the story. As you want. The success of Science Park's debaters in the upper grades sparked a new initiative that made learning debate part of the required curriculum beginning in the seventh grade. They were following the progress of debaters over the years, and it was clear that debaters did better in our international baccalaureate classes, in our AP classes. And they saw that the reason why there was more success was because the skill set that's used in debate is the same skill set that's used for any type of advanced academic work in the humanities. So they were like, why not teach all of our seventh graders this skill? Can you explain how you said that the footage should be released? Some people might ask for the footage to be, to be released and actually see what happened. But what I teach to the seventh graders is the same thing I teach to the ninth graders. I will hold their hands more in the seventh grade, but it's going to be the same. You have to talk about your framing. Your framing is the key to your whole debate. Claim is what your argument is about. Your warrant is to back up your claim, like evidence that you get from a text or an article. And your impact is why this um, argument is important. In the article you USF... have- We're training kids to make arguments, to be able to understand argumentation, to be able to understand intense text above your grade level. The thing that's really interesting is whether it be the AP exam or whether it be things that you're doing on IB or whether things that you're even doing on a lot of the park tests and what they attempt to do. They expect kids to have the skills of the data, but they never tell you that that's what they want. These are high level skills. Gaining high level skills through the academic play of debate is something Alston and others at Science Park are confident will have a dramatic impact on learning. Being able to learn debate allows them to see the world in a whole new way, not just in terms of the ideas that they get to receive, but also in terms of how they interact with each other. I think more kids are going to be on the debate team too, but then also I think that we're going to have a developing class that is smarter and that is like more progressive than before, because people are actually going to be thinkers. They're going to learn about like the world and how how to do it better. But people might not feel threatened because of the cameras. Everything that we've been talking about in the education reform debaters have been doing for years. So instead of like reinventing the wheel, creating these new tests, forcing kids to sit through hours and hours of test prep, spending money on tutoring for more test prep, making kids bubble day in, day out. Instead of doing that, hiring more debate coaches, getting kids to play debate. And I think that you'll have all of the, the results that you want to have. Who you have voted for and why? All right. All right, so when we're looking at the justifications, uh, here it goes, the justifications. So my debate, my principal uh, a few years ago, was, uh, my former principal, came to me and he was like, we, they actually looked at the, um, the debate, the debaters scores in AP and IB, uh, and they looked at the number of NFL points they had. And there was a direct correlation between the number of rounds the kids had debated, and the, the, how well they did on these tests. Um, and so that's why he came to me, because it was like, um, we had a debater who graduated a few years ago, Sunny Simon, uh, he really liked what she did, and she started debating in the seventh grade. And he was like, well, and that's what made him start looking at all of the different, you know, like is there a correlation between kids who debated in the seventh grade and started, and the number of rounds they had, and how well they do. Um, and he said that, you know, there was one, and he really wanted me to do this to really help with uh, that, that intensity. Um, and there are different justifications, right? Like, uh, that was the, in terms of the original justification, AP, IB, other tests. Um, the Common Core, uh, when I read the Common Core the first time, uh, I realized that a debater wrote that, right? Like, without knowing it, I knew a debater had written this. Because they, they, talks about, they talk about warranting claim, they talk about evidence. Uh, the Common Core was clearly written by a debater. When I talked to my former coach, Brent Ferrand, about it, he was like, yeah, and you know him, uh, David Coleman, uh, former debater at Stevenson High School, uh, who is now running the, uh, the college board. Um, and really, I, I believe most of his educational experience uh, came from high school debate. Uh, and 
And that was informing a lot of the language, I think, of the Common Core, because, I mean, I didn't know, I read it, you read it, all of you, when you read the Common Core, you were like, wait, this is very debate-centric. Um, and that's true in, for the standards in English, for history, and in science. So when I wrote the curriculum uh, for middle school debate, I used the curriculum standards for English, history, and science. Uh, and it actually, and we'll find that uh, it actually matches what other teachers uh, are doing. Um, I looked at another justification was just in terms of advocacy skills uh, for kids. Like I, the course is an advocacy course. It teaches kids how to advocate solutions to problems. That's how I. That's how I created the course. Um, and we can talk. We'll talk more about the specifics. But one of the selling points is. Debate's really popular in the summer, like these summer institutes that are popping up all over the place, uh, whether it's capital debate or other, other forms of like private debate institutes, a lot of these are for kids who don't compete competitively in high school. It's like you take piano, you take ballet, you take debate, and you often take it at the middle school level. And there are, there are middle class and upper middle class parents who are spending $2,000 to $4,000 for two to three weeks in the summer. And, I'm not, and again, I'm not talking about the policy debate camps of, that are six weeks. I'm talking about like parents who are like, my kid takes piano, my kid takes ballet, my kid takes debate, and they're in the sixth grade, and they might never debate in high school. And so what I tell them is that, look, in two, in, what, what parents, what, what middle class, because my school is a public school, and uh, most of our kids are poor working class. Uh, it's Newark. Newark is, Newark is a city where it's, you know, it is, economic, it is economically struggling. Um, but one of the things that we want to offer is that you can get an elite world-class education in an urban school. Uh, and it's also transferable to all the other schools in Newark. Because the curriculum that I wrote, uh, I encourage other people to, in other schools, to actually use that curriculum. They can work with that curriculum, and I would help them out with it. So it's not just for my school, it's for my district. Uh, and, and I think it, it would, and, and because of the nature of debate, I think it works well with that. Uh, another justification, and this is one where, uh, when I'm talking to teachers, like I, would, I run workshop for, our, our, for teachers in our district, um, both at our school and other schools. And one of the things that I, I try to tell, I, I try to connect to the other teachers in terms of, debate, and this is both teaching debate and debate across the curriculum, what is asked of us as teachers, no matter what we teach, is to teach our students how to debate. One of the things we all learn in teacher's college or, wherever, or teacher training, or wherever we went, we learn Bloom's taxonomy. And that is the basis for, excuse me, often how we're evaluated is the basis for like, what we're expected to teach. And this is the newer version, on, and combined with the older version of Bloom's. Uh, when I, and it's recall, comprehension, application, analysis, synthesis, uh, evaluation, and, and the new one is remembering, understanding, applying, and analyzing, evaluating, and creation. But notice at the highest levels, whether it's uh, evaluation uh, in the old Bloom's or creation in the new one, uh, you are at, what is evaluation? It is make judgments and support those judgments with logical reasons. What is make judgments and support those judgments with logical reasons? It's debate. You are teaching kids how to make arguments. And often with teachers, we're never really told or taught that that is what is expected of us. All of us is to make arguments. Teach kids how to make arguments about stuff. Teach kids how to make arguments about math teach kids how to make arguments about science, teach kids how to make arguments in English about literature, about a play, about a poem. But ultimately, what we're, what we're taught to do as teachers, period, is to teach kids how to make arguments. This is what we all do, and I, and I, and I tell this to the teachers, this is what we are all paid to do. We are, we, and our evaluations, I don't know, like each city or state is different, but most evaluations are the highest level of what they expect students to do is to do evaluation. Like, are the kids out creating? Are they evaluating? Are they making judgments? Are they supporting them with logical reasons? And I think that this, using Blooms, is a good way to connect to other teachers right. and a good way to say, hey, this isn't, like, this isn't magic. 
it's not like something that you're not, a, not, not only able to do, it is something that actually, when you're evaluated, your evaluator is expecting you to do it. To the point where, if you, if you are actually having kids make judgments and support them with logical reasons, and you're having other kids criticize those judgments, and you're having other kids question the warrants of what they're saying, and that is, in your, and that is going on within your classroom, then you are eligible for the highest evaluation from your supervisor. Or you have the basis by which you can challenge your supervisor, and because sometimes I have to do that. Sometimes I have to educate my supervisors because they don't know what they're seeing. Like sometimes, right? Like over the years, I've been teaching 20 something years. Uh, and so that, you know, there are always times when your supervisor goes, but the kid was confused and they, they, only, they only had to figure it out for themselves what was going on. Why didn't you tell them? And I'm like, because they figuring it out. They're That's why I asked them the question. Right. And when you saw her go, oh, that's what, that's called teaching and learning, right? That's the ah uh, moment when you're asking questions or posing questions. So those things, so this, I think, Bloom's Taxonomy uh, is really essential in, as a basis for this. Right. And so, and so my, my work in, in this particular thing was trying to focus in on debating across the curriculum. I mean, in my perfect world, uh, maybe when I win the lottery, I'm going to create you know, the debate school, right? I, you know, I, I, I was almost there. Uh, I, I was starting that. Um, and you know, I ran an a all-women's school in Chattanooga, and literally debate was our, debate was the basis of what happened in the school day. Um, and we kind of looked at those three claim data warrant in every single class. So if you were in science, and you had to, you know, write a justification for your lab. You had to make a claim. You have to, you know, you know, make a claim. You know, uh, provide some data and then a warrant for that claim. And so, in talking about impacts, implications, and those types of things, uh, once teachers understood that every single person in the building is a debater. Right, in whatever you want to call that word. And, and really, I think the part of what we have to debunk for some of our colleagues is the notion of a debater has to be specialized and a debate coach is a specialized training. Yes, some of you are you know, brilliant debate coaches and you, like the te technical X's and O's of debate, uh, you're great at. But the basis of what you start with your teaching your students is is simple that simple enough that any relatively educated person can recreate that right because at the beginning of what we do in debate is like okay make an argument you know you know make an argument you know back up that argument right and of course anybody who is I, I, as I tell teachers when I've done these, this training is right. Every single one of us has had to write a paper with a thesis. And we had to, you know, and you had to go in there with that professor and that professor, ah, yeah, I'm not seeing evidence for this. Right? And you had to have those sort of arguments on how you took from the text to make those evidentiary arguments. And I think that when we start from that and try to debunk that part, I think debate across the curriculum changes the way students engage in everything. Right, when you tell students that they, can, that they can argue with their teachers about how they're learning stuff and that their teacher isn't going to put them in a the corner, right? not send them to the office. And especially uh, when you're talking about in urban schools, in schools where kids don't, I mean, I walked into a school where kids literally, there was a line down the hallway Right, you know, if you were walking on the right side, you had to be on the right side of the line, and if you're on the left side of the line, and that you had to be on the wall. So if you got near the middle, you were considered in kind of no man's land, and I mean, and you were, you know, like, hey, move, get over there. Shout right? out to the charter schools. Right, shout out to charter <laughs> schools. Right? Of course, why? That's why charter schools do not let me present, um, and because. We did it, and we changed all of that culture, and it still worked. So all the things that they thought were going to increase test scores, right, 
it worked. Now, nobody talks about us at all. We don't go to charter school meetings because they would go, everybody else is doing it the other way. So I think that that's the thing. And I think that our job, um, which I think will help us as debate coaches, is to convince other people in our schools to do debate-oriented activities so that, that we can recruit some of these people to be part-time debate coaches. Uh -huh. um, right? And, and, and so, so I think that there's an opportunity for it across the board. I think that we have to continue to educate them. I think that we have to kind of create this as a framework and talk about those things kind of in sort of standards-based education within our building. So it's, it's, you know, most schools have some sort of theme or they have how, a framework about how they want to talk about things. I think we have to get debate into that framework uh, of discussion. Uh, I will have a shout out to uh, Principal Maria Ortiz of uh, Luis Munoz, uh, Luis Munoz uh, Middle School in Newark. Uh, she is the sister of a former debater like 20 years ago, Narciso Ortiz. Uh, she became principal of Luis Munoz and she was like, I want all my teachers to be debate coaches. And that's one of the schools I did workshop, I did uh, two workshops for. Um, now, she went to the point of hiring a former debater, um, uh, um, Shibun Kukreja, um, to, to be on staff. And her sole purpose was to teach teachers how to apply debate skills within that class. Um, she also went to this extent, like now, uh, Shibun Kukreja is now a high school coach at, an, at a school in Newark, Technology High School in Newark. But the next year, she headhunted one of the best uh, middle school coaches in the city, because Newark has a large city, uh, middle school city debate league. Uh, the Newark Debate Academy does a great job in terms of pushing a lot of middle schools to have debate programs. So she wanted to have a really good debate program, and there was this really, really good middle school at Park Elementary School. So she was like, want to come work for me? And so she literally brought that coach to teach teachers the exact same things that, that, that uh, Mr. Williams is talking about uh, in terms of it, it, it exists in all classes and how do you get these skills uh, and starting with what he had talked about in terms of the parts of an argument like claim warrant impact. Um, I just want to jump on that because one of the, one of the workshops that I gave in school um, was to uh, was to English teachers, and I gave that this also to English teachers at uh, Central High School a few years back. Um, and that was, when we're teaching AP and IB exams, one of the things they actually don't specifically tell you is that there is an implied format to it, but it's the same format as all academic writing. Whether you're writing a five page, whether you're writing a five paragraph essay, a five-page essay, a ten-page essay, or a full thesis. And it's like you have a major claim, which is your overall thesis. You have minor claim one, warrant for minor claim one, impact of minor claim one back to that larger thesis. Minor claim two, warrant for minor claim two, impact for minor claim two, back to that thesis, and on and on, right? So whether or not you're dealing with a major academic paper, like in college or grad school or middle school, or the five-paragraph essay, they actually, for, for the advanced writers, they actually expect you to do this. This is true even of the most recent Park exam, which tries to mirror itself over AP. And it is that debate training that allows them to do that. A lot of <coughs> English teachers find it actually easier to use the language of claim warrant impact because it's a, it, is, it is easier to train them. The science teachers were using Toolman, which is like data, one, data warrant, right. And that was, I, I find that a little more confusing. I like, I like the debate way in terms of claim warrant impact. Um, but some teachers do too, but the science teachers were using that and they, and they ended up translating, right? Um, because it really is just a matter of seeing that all they're being asked to do is make an argument. And when that, and when that happens, it makes all the teachers' jobs so much easier. And I think that that's the, the thing that makes it as a, when it becomes a school culture, um, then the kid doesn't have to change from class to class because every teacher is, ask, is asking for the same thing. 
And I think that the kids get it. I think it's hard for us as adults to get it. Because uh, we go, well, the way I do it, it started off. It's like, but the language in a science class, I mean, you're still trying to get the same things out of the kids. They're, I mean, I, I, you know, I was talking to a science teacher, and uh, we were talking about this. They were having climate debates, so I helped them structure these climate debates. And I said, but what do they do at these climate conferences except for have big old nasty ugly debates. Um, and he was like, yeah, that's exactly it. And I said, and what they do is that like, hey, the last time I was at this climate debate, you roasted me on you know, X, Y, Z set of data and my analysis of that data. I said, what do you think they're gonna come to the next one with? They're gonna come armed for bear to debate that argument. And I said, and that's what, and I said, and that's what kids do. I said, if they, if they, quote unquote, lose a debate in class about a particular part of something, I said, you don't have to tell them, I don't have to tell my middle schoolers if they lose a debate on, on the mascot, right, and whether the mascot is violent, whether or not they're going to dig in for the next debate, they're going to find out representations of that and that there's never a sort of good reason that a knight, that a knight represented violence. Right? It's also had chivalry and all that other stuff, but it was violent, right? The night was, was a thing, and of course, I had one of these debates, and a kid literally found like six or, six or seven different references over time of why a night was a symbol of violence, because she had lost a debate about that the night was that, because she said the night wasn't violent, it was that, you know, it was a symbol of, you know, you know, honor and da 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 da, and the other kids are not that why they have a big old sword, right? I mean, all the all the different things, and so I think, and, and that was not something I had to teach them or tell them they had to do. They just knew that the next debate was coming up, and that they were going to have to go against that. And I think that that's the same thing that happens in class, which is the encouragement for it across the curriculum. Is that teachers always have this big problems like, well, my students, they only do the minimum, or they only do what I ask them to do, they don't really take any initiative, right? It's like because of the fact that we haven't given them any incentive to take any initiative, because they know, okay, well, tomorrow we're gonna come to class and they're gonna go, rah, 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 rah. Right, you know, and I got ADD out the yang, so I would never pay attention to that stuff anyway. Um, so, uh, but that gives kids the, the opportunity to do that, and teachers don't have to do that have to teach them that, especially once they teach them the basic skills and whatever class. Once you've learned that, it doesn't change in math, it doesn't change in social studies, those types of things. And so I think that that's one of the things that us as an organization uh, could really do to help um, create more opportunities. And I think then, quite literally, we create more debate coaches. Not maybe not people like us that travel lots and lots of weekends, but we create debate coaches that maybe just like, hey, you know what? I'm willing to take on local competition or whatever it might be. And now instead of having two people in your building, you might have six. And I think that that's a lot more sustainable. Especially like I mean, I'm a, I'm a football coach. We got nine people on the football staff, right? Nine, uh, because. It, it's like you really can't do it by yourself. And I mean, we do it, but, but I think that cross curriculum is so important. Yes? So about half of the teachers that I work with are, are international. Right. Um, and English is sometimes their fourth, fifth, sixth language. Right. And I was having conversations about some, some of this, what is it that you're, you're talking about? Because um, because you're absolutely right. As I, I tell my, my students all of the time for, for English or journalism, I say, well, listen, you've got to learn how to debate because everything that they want you to do is it's exactly in the debate form. Well, you're absolutely 100% correct. But a lot of the teachers um, were not used to hearing the debate jargon. What? And so instead, I sort of translated it yes. into what I call ICE, which is introduce, cite, and explain. Mm -hmm. That made it a lot easier for several of the other teachers to actually sort of understand because it, in their heads, they could kind of get around that as an acronym. 
And oftentimes what it is that I've found is, is that for, for teachers who maybe see debate as being this sort of thing or, or debate skills as being this thing, well, you're just really teaching them to have conflict for argument. Right. And it's not really the case. So sometimes I think maybe sort of shifting the language. Right. And, that, and that's a good segue into the notion of, I think when you talk about it, like, I, when I discuss it with teachers or whatever, I try to use as little debate jargon as humanly possible. Um, things that make sense in, like claim, make sense in any right. sort of thing, right? A warranted argument, right? Or evidence-based argument may, makes sense because that's the same language they use to their students. So try not to go about disads and permutations and whatever, you know, other debate words. Because I think that that's, I think part of that is just like any specialized group that our language makes us comfortable, right? Because it's like if, you know, when I speak to a debate person, I speak in debate language because that language is familiar to all of us. And so that is great for us, but for people who are on the outside looking at us, go, whoa, wait a second, I don't know that stuff. But I, and I think that the simpler it is, and then the encouragement is, have those discussions. The big fear is, you know, is teachers losing the classroom. Well, I mean, let me right? speak to that for a second. Go ahead. The, uh, one of the things in terms of debate uh, that it brings out is that many people have a perception of what debate, who, who are good debaters, who are naturally will be good debaters, who are there. Um, the good thing about teaching it as a class is two things. First, people who normally are not considered or would not consider themselves debaters are put into a space where they're encouraged to debate. Uh, I find this with I find this with black black kids in general. Uh, many times in various places that are integrated, they find that the black kids don't come out for debate. Uh, and the uh, in other places, many kids are many many black kids are encouraged to do sports and do other things. They're not encouraged to debate or see themselves as debaters, making it as a course kind of encourages everyone to do that, right? Like, or at least a lot of people start to find themselves in the skill because it's required. But I would argue, secondly, that it is the, the, the student who is the behavior problem, the student who is like the, the hardest to quote control, is one that is also will find themselves with, or can find themselves with debate. We had a particular student uh, that we were teaching uh, who was a problem in every other class but debate. And it would be, there were kids who, and he was a student who was failing other classes, but there were kids who wanted to partner with him at other tournaments because they wanted to win. So this, and, and so even though he was known for not being a good student, he was known for being a behavior problem. All the kids wanted to partner with him in a debate because they knew that if they partnered with this kid, they could win. Right. And so, um, I mean, those of you who like data, I mean, they've done a couple of surveys about debate across the curriculum. And, you know, and since we can't do two PowerPoints, um, I was just going to share some of that data with you. Or you could just write notes. Right. I don't know. I, okay. Then we have to. <laughs> all right, all right. That's okay. fine. Like, I mean, in the level, they did, like, student surveys at some of these things. And then, you know, we did my own student survey when I was at uh, the Chattanooga Girls Leadership Academy. And the level of student engagement, um, like, 92% of the student survey said that, uh, that debate in the classroom made them more uh, excited about coming to class. Um, uh, 89% of them said that they developed skills that they didn't think that they would develop uh, outside of having debates in the classroom. 75% um, of them said that they felt like it increased their academic performance. Uh, and then like 84% of them says that their level of content knowledge increased as a result of debate in the classroom. And that was a pretty, you know, when you talk about surveying an entire school, that's pretty significant in terms of them uh, getting excited about uh, about debate and uh, so and I think that that's it, it, you know and, and I know that a, a lot of us are familiar with the project that Steve Stein was leading in uh, Boston and that the, the data that he got back from that was just incredible in terms of how that just was reshaping the schools where he, uh, they were introducing debate 
uh, into those places. Uh, so I think that that's, I mean, and so that's one of the resources that if you haven't looked at that, uh, the Bait Across the Curriculum uh, manual, teacher's manual that uh, Steve created, if, if you were just like, I got 100 things on my plate, you know, I'm gonna do some presentation and talk about things in my school, they have a ton of just things that are just ready to go that you could say, hey, science teacher, here's an example of how you could do it as a science plan. And if you need addition, a little bit of additional help, I can kind of get you started on your first debate. Because I think that that's it. The barrier for entry is having the teacher have their first debate and have it go successfully. Then I think that then they introduce it uh, more because no, very few of us really want to take a risk in our classroom and having a debate that just the wheels fall off in and you're not really that skilled on how to bring the kids back from it. Um, you go, okay, well that was a disaster and of course I planned this disaster five more times today. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, um, you know, and I'm not going to do that. Um, so debate, so it goes, right? And so I think that us as the trained professionals helping people to do those things. Uh, our climate debates, um, it was three debaters who were in my middle school class against three kids who were not in the class. And so they did it for the, they did it for a group, group of teachers were kind of the judges and everything. And the teachers were, one, they were very impressed um, because they were like, oh wow, you know, the, this is pretty good yeah, because I had the debaters who had been debaters kind of group with the kids who weren't, and they, they were like, oh wow, you know. And I picked a couple of kids who were not big talkers. And once they got the research, they got the thing, they were like, that kid never talks in my class. They don't do anything like that. I said, well, because I said they, you know, they took this on and they were, they were doing it. And I think that that's one of the things that we have to figure out how to do and how to implement that into our curriculums because I mean David is I mean David was very intentional as part of this common core thing. I I, I saw him in uh, uh, February when I was up there and uh, helping out at uh, a consulting job and he was like yeah you know debate debate gut he said you know he said if we can have AP debate he said I just haven't figured out how to make it work, right? Like he said, I haven't figured out how to make a debate course AP. That's that uh, new research Right, class. yeah, it's a re yeah. It, it is a research it's class. 2018. Yeah, yeah, it's a research class. But he was like, you know, actual debate as an AP class, he said, because, you know, it, it is AP. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I so I think that that's, I think that's really, I think that's really hard. And I think that this is the place where we can get a lot of schools on board with debate that have traditionally shy away from debate. Because every principal, at every principal's meeting I would go to, they would go, what can I do to get my teachers more excited? What can I do to get kids moving in the right direction? Because trust me, you're, when you go every day and someone calls you and says, hey, how, how are the kids doing? How are your scores gonna be? You know if you don't get your scores up this year, you're gonna get fired. And right, you go, oh, okay, yeah, no problem. All right, I'll go back to work now. Uh, great, thank you. Right. And, that, and that's a lot of pressure, especially in urban school districts on principals to try to get the needle moved. And this, I believe, is the best way to get that needle moved. Because even if you're an inexperienced teacher, debate itself allows your students to become experts and teach themselves things that you may or may not be able to teach them. And I was gonna say, right along with that, one of the things that debate actually teaches as a course of it, like if you're teaching it as a course, um, one of the, one of the uh, advantages is you get to teach kids how to read things well above their grade level. Um, I have seventh graders, um, but we, and they, the evidence that they have uh, is, is canned evidence, right? Like, uh, they learn how to do research in certain parts, but a lot of the stuff that they do is actually packed, given to them because they have to learn things in snippets. The evidence that they're given is evidence that, you know, is debate stuff. Like, it is stuff that is way above their grade level. 
But we have to go through a process by teaching them to read things above their grade level, which often is the, right now. Okay, good. which is often the the way in terms of teaching debate. And I always teach with them. I teach at a level of critical how to critical how to do critical reading, um, how to read things above your grade level. Uh, one of the things debaters talk about in, the, in these kids who are taking it as a class is they talk about how in arguments with their friends they use bigger words than them, and how some kids get in trouble because. Their parents think that they're trying to be funny because they're using bigger words. And they are. And to some extent, they are trying to be funny because they're like, ha, ah, I know this word, you don't, right? And so that, so that those things are, are going out. But one of the things that I do is um, real simple uh, five steps for reading. And first, look up the word that you don't know, write it down. Identify the specific question that you have. Uh, that you have. Like if, if you've looked at the word and you still have questions about the text, then identify that question and write it down, like what question you have. I think that probably is one of the most important things to do. Uh, then three, take your best guess uh, as to the correct answer and write that down. Uh, as you continue reading, see if what you're reading supports or denies your answer, write that down. Five, continue steps one through four as needed. Honestly, when I, when I do this, and this is a direct result of debate and teaching kids how to read debate, I mean, read evidence that's above their grade level over time. And this is also how to teach kids how to annotate without just telling them to write stuff down. Uh, because I always believe that annotations are for the kid, not for the teacher. And often kids think that annotating is a waste of time because most of the time it actually is. But if you're looking, it is because it's not for them. They're doing it for the teacher and they're writing stuff down for the teacher. But if the questions that, but if you're writing down words you don't know and the questions are yours, and the guesses of the answers are yours, and you're writing those down. That, I think, is the proper way to annotate text. Uh, and we teach that to debaters. We also teach them questions to write down after they finish these steps. Uh, and the first question, uh, the first thing they should write, the question they should answer is, what argument does the author make? How does the author warrant her or his argument? Why does the author believe that her or his argument is important? Right? Those three questions, and, and the debaters see a natural connection between those questions that you answer at the end and the parts of an argument claim warrant impact. Right? Like what argument is the author making? Uh, how does she warrant her argument? Uh, why, does, why does he believe that his argument is important? Right? Like those are the ways in which you um, start to get those test scores higher because kids are reading this and they're, because of the competition, they are going to look for, I mean, kids are looking for evidence on their own. They're like, oh, I found this. Oh, I found this, right? The kids, because of their competition, the kids are self-motivated to be able to find stuff, produce stuff, read stuff. And this helps them do this when you're not around. Uh, so, the, uh, so that was the uh, part on critical reading. Um, I want to jump in the part on method in terms of the, the debate class. Right. And then uh, we can go, and then we can go back and forth in terms of this. Right. Also, stop right. us at any time uh, if you have questions. If you want to know anything else that we're doing, um, when what I end up doing for the course, uh, and this is particular to the debate course, is I say that there are six skills of debate, uh, and I, I just like case writing, line by line, extensions, crystallization, weighing, cross examination, uh, and the whole course is based around learning those skills at a particular point. But really, all these things are really just teaching them how to compare warrants and explain implications of arguments with respect to the topics. And this is also, in terms of debate across the curriculum, what we do when we teach kids to do this in class. They don't just, it's case writing, line by line, extensions, crystallization, weighing, cross-examination. Case writing, there are two parts of any case, whether, no matter, and I, I teach this course so they can do any form of debate. Uh, we use a lot of policy thinking, and we use a lot of policy language, but there's a difference between using, jar I think there's a difference between using jargon and understanding the original purpose of policy debate in terms of language. I think policy debate is great to teach ways of thinking and logic. Like, I think that arguments on the affirmative and the negative are just teaching different forms of advocacy and problem solving. 
And I think that people get caught up in jargon and they'd be like, oh, it's a you know, permutation. Or like really, it's just when we go into uh, the different forms of debate skills and then we go into more specific, like what is the strategy of advocacy, then it's like this forms of thinking in terms of policy debate is just normal thinking, right? <laughs> like if you're presenting an advocate, if you're advocating for a solution to a problem, there has to be a problem, right? There's no problem, there's no, and the kids talk about this. Well, why do you have, why does there have to be a problem in the status quo. Why does there have to be that? Why does that, and I might go in, why does there have to be a problem inherent in the status quo, right? And they would be like, well, there's no problem, there's no reason to do anything, there's no reason for a plan. Uh, well, why do you have to prove that you solve the problem? Well, because if you don't solve the problem, there's no reason to vote for you, right? And it's just through these questions, right? Like, why, why, do you, uh, why do you have to have some, why do the advantages to your plan have to outweigh the disadvantages? Well, like, even if it worked, if there are disadvantages to your problem, then like, if there are more problems with your solution, then why do it? It's a bad thing, right? So it's really not teaching policy debate in terms of here's a bunch of jargon. It's teaching it in terms of here's a, here are, you are a problem solver. There are, pro like, there are problems within our community. There are problems that, that need to be solved. Uh, I like to look at it in terms of I'm teaching kids in Newark how to think about and advocate problems solutions to problems in our community. And we have to identify problems, identify a way to solve those problems, prove that it solves those problems, and then see if the advantages outweigh the disadvantages. Mm -hmm. And, yes? Oh, I just, I'm sorry. I, I just was going to ask, do you also have a particular textbook that you use? I don't. I don't use a textbook. Um, and, I mean, there are a lot of textbooks out there. Um, yeah. But the... But, I, don't, I, don't, I don't use one either. Right. I mean, I just... Basically, I, I formed the I formed my, our curriculum guide based on my knowledge of coaching, and so it's just really um, the curriculum that I wrote is a is just really based on uh, the years of experience, and even that's putting it together like the six to eight skills. I just made that up. Yeah, and I just use like in these things, I just use text, uh, and that's like what so the so. I talked about the critical components of a debate, so for teachers to be able to understand, is that that there are a couple things that, first of all, there has to be some sort of resolution, there has to be some sort of controversy. And for, for teachers, especially public school teachers, is I tell them the easiest thing to use is the standard, right? It's like, so whatever, the standard is usually, right, a, you know, a statement that you can turn into a question, right? Students need to be able to distinguish between X and Y, right? You can turn that into a question. The second part is that it has to have an essential content that is shared, right? Um, the, I think that the key to having those things is that the provide initially, the first couple debates is that scaffold material, right? I give two articles for the pro, two articles for the con, right? Everybody knows what those articles are. They're shared information, so everybody has the same information. Um, then, I think the third part, essential part for it, is a classroom debate, any type of debate, like that's like the, there has to be cross-examination, where they get to ask questions of the other person. Um, and then finally, I think the most important part is some sort of structured feedback. Um, that the that structured feedback from the teacher, but more importantly from the other students. Yeah. Because if everybody reads the same information, they can give and go, well, why didn't you use paragraph six? Didn't paragraph six better prove your argument than paragraph two? which is the one you use, right? And I think that those exchanges in the feedback part, and, I, and that if, you, if you think about every one of your debates with those components in it, you can have a debate about any of the things that you're having in class um, all the time, especially when you're talking about, yes, professor? Oh, you oh and you can have those any time. And so if the teacher just sits there when they're writing a the lesson plan, which is an important part to say, okay, if I know that those four components have to exist for each one of my debates, right? Now then a question of time, how many times, you know, how many people are on each side, you can decide that just about whatever your time is and how much time like, you want to have. So if you want to have debates where it's three students against three students, you can de determine how many 
um, you know, minutes each student gets, right, when the cross-examination period is going to be, uh, those types of things, right, and, and again, these are all things that, you know, you can have it, you know, more open, you can have it more closed, you can, you can have all those different things, but the students know that not only do I have to speak, but I have to interact, right, that they're going to challenge me, right, after I've said something. And ask me questions, and I think that interaction, that back and forth, is where the real learning happens. Because now I've read the same article that you read, and I'm asking you what you think uh, about that. Yes, sir. I noticed that delivery or presentation skills is not part of the skills that you advocate. Is that uh, intentional in regards to not including that as a? Course? It is. It is implied in all of those skills. Right. Right. Because like, like in other words, I. It is the uh, part of the, and, and it's part of what I, and maybe the, and this is because it is particular to the style in which I teach. I'm always like, you know, here's your posture, stand up straight, enunciate, clear, right? So that is the implicit, that is the implicit teaching behind everything. So every, it's assumed in every single thing that you do that your presentation will be awesome. Right, and I, and I think I always start with sort of, you know, the Aristotle, uh, you know, about the notion of, you know, ethos and pathos and those things. And like, and so kids, and kind of let them explore those things. And say, so look, every, every, I, I, and I tell teachers this, and I tell my students this, like, every, every time you advocate for something, you're trying to persuade someone, right? And, and I said, and, and how you choose to persuade Right matters because it you know and I said yeah and I said you're gonna see debates where people are faster or slower those types of things but they have to choose their they have to choose the audience and they have to choose to persuade those audiences right and sometimes time is an issue those things but that persuasion I think the art of persuasion is so such an important part of this and I think all those different things are part of that process. Right, because again, you can you can be very persuasive, but if you drop an argument, like if they make three arguments and you answer the first two and you're persuasive on the first two and they stand up and say, Well, I made three arguments and they didn't really say anything to my third argument, and I think it's pretty good, right? And they should have answered it, I said, You're in trouble. And, and and the kids go, Yeah, I can see that. And that makes sense to them, right? You know, and they're like, what if I don't have an answer to the third argument? I said, well, you know, that's when you got to come up with the, well, my other two are really good, and that third argument, I don't know. I think it's got some problems. And I said, you know, and that's one of those things we have to learn, and those, those skills. So I think that those components, that's what you go back and tell people they do. And all of that stuff has nothing to do with debate jargon. Like, you have to have a... You have to have a resolution that's an essential question, right? And everybody in public education and education understands what an essential question is. You have to have shared text, right? You have to have a cross-examination period, and then you gotta have some sort of feedback loop. And then that's it, that's it for the debate. And you can, you know, I said, you can have point values, you can do whatever kind of thing you wanna do for that, but, and let people talk, that's it. Um, I do this, I'm certified in Texas in instructional development, and I have a evidence-based learning debate across the curriculum workshop thing that I've done as well. And I have a really easy format um, that I share in that little session um, that teachers seem to like really find, especially ones you know, that may be a little resident, that find um, like really access accessible and it allows you to use like groups um, mm -hmm. and, and, and multiple groups. Um, and the idea of, um, behind this little format is, you know, especially if you have a, a larger class, um, you know, where you're able to put it into groups of like three or four that may even have like five or six people is that they debate in groups, each group might nominate three people to be the public advocates, everybody else mm -hmm. in the group are the like researchers, researchers right. speech writers, coaches, <coughs> assisters, you know, right. those things. They huddle. So, right. And so, you know, your comment of, you know, you create this central question, 
you know, I do this in my in my mass media class, you know, like what was the most influential ad campaign of your lifetime, right? right. You know, so group one picks their what they think is their campaign, group two, three, four, et cetera. Um, and so then each group gives an opening statement, right? right? They nominate mm -hmm. somebody from an opening statement, blah, blah, blah. So you go through, you know, the four groups opening statement, and then all the groups get a chance to powwow. Right, exactly. Right? So then they powwow as a group of whole, the people that aren't part of the public speakers, uh, you know, you know, they contribute, right? And then there's a, a second level of argument, right? You know, this right. idea of extension, right? So wave two, where you start to clash, why is your better, right. you know, than mm -hmm. those, et cetera, et cetera. Each group gets, you know, one of those. Then you have another powwow session, right? And then you have like a closing argument, right? Uh, you know, for each side. Um, and, um, you know, and then, you know, you try to pick a winner and, and those things. And, you know, I've done them with like really big, Groups, you know, right. like a big class of twenty-four, where you put them into, you know, groups of six uh, or groups of four, you know, six people each or whatever. Um, I've also done, you know, where you just do one or two groups against each other and then have the other groups judge. Right. Um, those things. The nice thing about that format is, you know, if you got block schedule, you can extend the prep times or the, you know, speaking time. You know, if you have multiple groups, if you have to deal with a short amount of time. You know, you can have quick little short speeches or whatever. I found that that was an interesting because the kids who found themselves not to be public speakers, at least initially, you know, really enjoyed the support role. Right. Um, and then usually the second time they were like, oh yeah, no, I'm getting out. I'm getting out, yeah, right. That's that's right. That, those people were ridiculous. Or like if, right. if somebody doesn't mouthpiece quite the way they, you know, had like prepped or whatever. Uh, and so, you know, as far as your, and we've, you know, thrown some cross X elements in or whatever, but um, as far as, uh, and I found like the, we, I have a sophomore world history teacher now who uses this format all the time. Right. Um, you know, and a couple of science teachers that are using this format, mm -hmm. um, you know, the AP environmental studies and right. some, some freshman biology and, and some of those things. And, um, and so anyway, and so if people, I think that's the other thing too is, always in these situations when we're dealing with our peers is giving them really accessible right. like activities. Right? That, yeah, exactly. That's one where a teacher's like, oh, okay, okay, I can do that. I can do that, right. right? I can see how that allows for managing of the room. I can see how that gets every kid involved. involved right. And sometimes the, the traditional debate of two versus two or whatever, you know, people seem to- The, the 22 kids are kind of sitting right. there exactly. and, and being a passive observer. And I think that that's, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, maybe one of the things that we could do as an organization is maybe, uh, you know, sure. obviously our web people, uh, Chris, I know you're on that, that thing, is that maybe create a section with debate across the curriculum on there, and then we could put up these resources um, and be a resource for people to come, and we can say, hey, here are some formats. Because I have like six or seven formats uh, for yeah, different yeah. things, like for science class, for <laughs> different uh, different things, and um, and so we can put those things up so that people can access those. And then most of them uh, I've done where it's actual lesson plan, so they don't need, they you know they can just go. Here's my lesson plan. This is what I'm going to do, uh, which is important in some places that you have to have it absolutely written out. Uh, they have to know what it is. So I think that that's one of the things that we that definitely should come out of this uh, discussion. Yeah, and, and to, to add on that, the uh, I think that to add on what both of you were saying, I think that formatting is great because it's really just saying that it has to like in the classroom there has to be conflict, and there has to be conflict preferably over text, right? So that there is comparison and a comparison of warrants, a comparison of what's going on and how you're defending your text and what the implications of that are. And I think all of those formats kind of share that. Mm -hmm. uh, but to out further with uh, the question that you asked before, uh, Mr. Timmons, when you, uh, there is a difference. Uh, I think there's, there's a difference with me when I teach the regular like public speaking, you know, speak clearly, enunciate, that kind of stuff. And what you were talking about in terms of ethos, pathos, logos. Mm -hmm. I think that the ethos, pathos, logos is more the advanced skill. For, for middle school debate, the first part of it really is just the logic of the argument, right? And yes, I'm teaching them how to stand up straight and speak clearly, et cetera. But that's like the basic of persuade. That's the very, very rudiments of, you know, you will speak clearly, you will enunciate, you will, and that goes with everything. 
But I do think that when you're talking about like what makes, if the round is closed, what makes you choose between one person and the others, uh, I, I heard from you a couple of years ago in the lecture you gave, uh, then what is that, right? And those are the elements of, e of, of pathos uh, and ethos. And those are the elements that I think are, I think those are advanced debate skills actually. Like a lot of times people are like, oh, there's, you know, debate's just about logos. But I think that some of the more advanced skills and the skills that my eighth graders get are the, like, when the round is close, how do you get somebody to vote for you versus someone else? And that's what we, uh, that, those are, in terms of middle school debate too, we definitely concentrate on, on the pathos and logos more because they already know the basic parts of debate. And in terms of just the way they function, it seems like the kids are like struggling with the logic, mm -hmm. and then after they struggle with the logic, then they can get the, oh, okay, this is how you make it persuasive. This is how language is used this way. This is how to get someone to go this way or this way on it. And that's just really much more, I, I think, much more advanced. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, in the uh, middle school debate part, the, uh, so one of the things that is really important in terms of just teaching debate is I do, there's like a step-by-step -step with everything. Uh, and for little kids, I think it's important to give them step-by-step. -step. And in the step-by-step -step stuff, um, a little shout out to Shane Hertzig, uh, because he is a, he's a debate coach at Harrison High School. And he is, really good with uh, giving people almost like um, step by step of what do you say in order, like logically what do you say in order to like do line by line, do extensions. And I do these little things and it's, they're just, uh, besides that it's little things that, what do you say? How do you say it? Like in the extension step one, signpost your argument, like tell where you are and in terms of a flow. And this is for middle school debate, to where they understand this flows, et cetera. Step number two, restate the important part of your warrant. You restate the analysis, uh, the evidence. Step number three, and, and so the, these are just steps for each one of them. And giving them to those, I think kind of helps. And to the, some extent, even the little script, my, on my first argument, which states, and fill in the blank, uh, that's somewhere around here too. Uh, but really, it's just a matter of, uh, like, one, let's look at my first, second, third argument, which states, briefly state the one sentence claim. And so these are things that I find helpful for them, too, just in terms of that format. Like, give them, give them little things to help them, especially if they're seventh grade. Well, this is true for seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. But the, uh, give them these little steps, and I think that it makes, ultimately, uh, that work easier. I just wanted to throw that in there in terms of uh, the middle school debate stuff. Um, the next part I, that I want to give, again, a shout out to the Nerd Debate Academy. Uh, because when teaching middle school debate, I get a lot of help, right? I get a lot of help from uh, the Nerd Debate Academy really runs debate in the city of Newark. Uh, shout out to Brent Ferran, Carlos Estacio, uh, for making sure that we have one of the largest middle school debate uh, programs in the country. Uh, there are times where there are close to 300 kids at a middle school debate tournament. Uh, this year, I actually brought like 63 kids to a tournament. Uh, and if you include the high school kids who were judges, at over 80 kids at one tournament uh, this year. Um, and this, and they encourage the expansion of that uh, within the district greatly. So use like either use local resources that you have, or help create those local resources. Because I'm always encouraging you not just to do it within your classroom and not just like teach debate in terms of middle school debate within the class, but can you make that so it can help the rest of the district? Can you make it so that other teachers in other schools would be encouraged to like actually form debate classes? Um, one of the kids who was in the video, his father was, his father became principal of uh, a school across town, University High School across town, and he is seriously considering uh, having a teacher teach middle school debate because of his son's experience in my class. Um, and so that, that is where I think that for districts, teaching middle school debate, because it's new, because it's potentially, I think, so revolutionary to education, I think part of the mission of teaching it is also to expand it uh, and make it easier for other people to do it. So if anyone has any questions on that or anyone uh, wants any information on, on it, 
uh, NorkScienceDebate at gmail.com. I can email you a lot of the stuff uh, that we have. Um, but I think that uh, generally, the, we've gone over most of the things that for this, right? right. And, I, and I guess we'll take questions. I wanted to end with like one uh, quote before we got the questions and, uh, and, and I'll tell you. Uh, imagine a school where the students are engaging in debate as a regular part of their instruction in all of their classes. And you are imagining a school where students graduate in high numbers with all the skills necessary to succeed in college and beyond. And that's from Melissa Wade. Uh, and when she wrote this in the sort of in the forward of the National Debate Project, and I think it's true, right? I think it's true that that's if you walk into a school where that's happening, then all the other things that we worry about in schools, I just don't think, I don't think that, that, that they're happening in the numbers that we see that they're happening now. Uh, so yeah, and and I think that the even larger implications are there. Like I noticed that on my team and in our school. Um, the, the more students who are involved in debate or just exposed to debate, often they start to question other things, like debate is a lifestyle. They start questioning teachers. Uh, teachers who they start, you know, I mean, they start questioning, you know, like there was an incident where uh, a bunch of eighth graders like formed a little protest and like, you know, you might as a teacher get blamed for this, but you actually have nothing, like as a debate coach, have nothing to do with the student activism and stuff. I, I teach them how to think critically, it becomes a lifestyle and they do it. Uh, and, on the, and that's on a small level, right? Like where they're like, hey, I, the way in which you taught this test was unfair because you didn't teach us this and this, but it was on the test and, or whatever, like those things come out and they expect teachers to be able to warn what they say. Like you can't just say, do it. You gotta be able to explain why. And they will, add, they will talk challenging teachers in this way. Uh, but I think that they will also start, generally, um, we find that in our school, people, kids, various kids get involved in activism within the city. Uh, they become community activists afterwards. The question it becomes a lifestyle. Um, we had uh, we had debaters responsible for taking over the superintendent's office for 72 hours. Debaters and former debaters. I didn't know anything about it. I really didn't know anything about it. Right? <laughs> like, and I'm not saying this. And I'm not saying this just to say this. Is that like as a debate coach, I'm focused on debate. Uh, some of the kids who like are involved in that, I was trying to get to go to tournaments, but they were like, no, they thought that was more important. They were like, oh, we're doing something else. I was like, oh, well, you should be doing this. I was like, oh, they're, we're involved in some other stuff. And they get involved in some other stuff, and they don't go to debate tournaments anymore. So we've had some kids leave the debate team, not go to debate tournaments, and then go and do community activism stuff. And like, you know, it, it happens. But I think ultimately that's good for the country, and I think that's good for our communities. So, so questions, I mean, we probably have, like, I'd say 12, 15, we, we call it so that people can get some lunch before the one o'clock session. Questions? Jonathan, how long is it? So your middle school class, which is now required in seventh grade, if I recall correctly, right. is that a semester, or is it a year long? Uh, it's the, it's, it's, uh, for the last two years, it's been a year long, uh, and it's covered all of the seventh graders. Uh, next year, it will be one quarter, but it will be one, but each of them will have it for one quarter, but there will only be 12 debaters. So in other words, Instead of having all the debaters all year round, I will have all the debaters for 10 weeks. So instead of a class of 25, I'll have a class of 12. So I'll have 12 debaters for 10 weeks. Um, and, that will, and that will rotate with the other debaters. So those six elements, sorry to interrupt you, th those six elements, you're pretty intensive on each of those. So when you have a list of six things, that's what, a week's worth of curriculum at least or so? No, those six things is the entire course, sure. right? Like the six right. debate skills, that's the whole course. But I mean, each so, but like each line item there is more than that, I guess, right? If it was a full year course. Yeah, but it's it's um, the way it starts off. Well, in terms of the curriculum, um, we spend we it most of these things are done all the time, right? Once they like once they do the basic case writing, yeah. uh, case construction, what is it like? And once they do the uh, and once they do once they do case construction, which is as framing and arguments that link back to it, no matter what format you're in, public forum, policy, whatever, this, you, frame it, you frame the debate, and then you have arguments that link back to that frame. Uh, and that's like, you know, that, there are the definitions, and then there's the debate. They do most, it's a performance class where you're debating all the time, right? So they're learning about these. So I'll give them the definition of line by line, I'll give them the steps for line by line, but they'll learn by doing line by line. 
I'll give them the, extent, the steps for extensions, and, and here's what extensions are, so there'll be a lesson on that, why they're important. But then they, there's the debate, right? Crystallization weighing, cross-examination, same thing. So there might be specialized one class on each of them, just talking about that. Yeah. But for the most part, it happens in the course of the debate, where they're doing a lot, and they'll use, so, because this, these are things that happen in every debate. Yeah. So most of the debate is, you know, you're doing the performances, you're doing the drills, and there's some, some where you're just testing out each other's research, you're criticizing people's research, uh, you're breaking it down into smaller drills where kids are cross-examining each other and going after each other, uh, and, it's, and you teach them how to do it in a civil way, right? Like there was a debate where a uh, kid got excited and started like screaming at the top of his lungs into <laughs> his, his opponent's ear. I was like, nah, you don't really do that, that's not good. But so there's the way that you teach that to do, but, but ultimately it's performance. So I have these down as the six debate skills because they take place in every single debate that happens. Uh, and no matter what, from middle school all the way through the last round of the NDT, you're doing these six things. Um, and there could be others, right? Like the, uh, the, because the, I think that uh, Mr. Timmons raises a good point in terms of like the advanced persuasion and when you're talking about ethos, pathos, logos, that is something that I teach separate from this, but it is a part of all these, it is a part of how to do all these things better, right? Um, but it is like a persuasion skill that is taught. So this isn't exact, but it's something that takes place in every single debate. And, and at Pace, we have the seventh and eighth grade, uh, we have seventh grade debate class, eighth grade debate class, and then it's for the year. Uh, it's a full year. Full year. Yeah. So I'm for the full year. And so I, you know, obviously spend time on all, I mean, I spend time on these all six of these things. I mean, John and I talked about this all summer when we were talking about middle school. So we're teaching almost the exact same curriculum. Um, and, and, and so it's really good because of the fact that you can stop, you know, because you have tournaments, you're going to middle school tournaments in between, you can stop doing things. Um, you know, one of the things that I do is I like, I try to expose them to different formats. Um, and we, I mean, we've done, you know, Lincoln Douglas debates, traditional policy debates, public forum debates, world school debates, um, you know, MMA debates, which is my favorite. Uh, <laughs> 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 Where you just throw out a topic and everybody's in. Like it's all in. Just start swinging. Um, I, I, those are the best. Um, uh, um, and so, so yeah, we do it for, do, do it for the, yeah. Uh, now, uh, Mr. Timmons, how at Green Hill, your middle school classes are how how long? Uh, they're fifty five minutes long. Uh, you can do it uh, trimester. Right. Uh, it's a way that it's set up. Um, you we have a uh, seventh grade course that every seventh grader has to take. That's basic speech. Uh, after you take that, even in seventh grade, you can then opt into uh, doing debate. Okay. And in eighth grade, you have the option of doing. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, anybody else out here? Or they have a middle school class. Nobody else. Okay. Yeah. We, we did a middle school program for a couple of years. Part of the reason I'm very interested is we're moving into a graded class instead of a, the way we've had it is all the middle school debaters are put in the same free period, and when we're when I choose, we can meet at that free period as a okay. class, but. It's not a good system they have to miss because their free period is doing a test and then right. they're not going to the next tournament so they didn't come to this right. free period then they didn't learn that. And anyway, the class is going to be much better. Right. But, but you think, but because you're still competing, you don't think of it as like week one case writing, week two line by line, week three. No, you just keep it. all. And, and I think with middle schoolers, yeah. I mean, just by any other debaters, I think middle schoolers, everything becomes relevant yeah. and I mean, you gotta, I mean, some days, I mean, with middle schoolers, you just gotta, you, you just gotta go where the wind takes you. I mean, and, and, you know, you may say, hey, today we're gonna talk about case writing, and it's like, they're going, well, you know, I read this thing in the newspaper, and, you know, I, I'm kind of upset about it, and I wanna say something about it, and then, of course, if you let one of them say something about it, like, yeah. I read it too, and so, you have to have a debate. You have to have like let them debate that out. But I think that you can go okay. But 
You can't just sit up here and say, you know, your opinion or whatever. Let's all read the article. Let's all let's let's make arguments. And but again, what is that doing? Line the line, crystallization, that sort of thing. So I think that that's one of the things you have to be if you're going to teach middle schools. You've got to be flexible. Too much to do not. That's bad. I was just going to clarify, Adam, the way that I like, kind of conceive of this stuff, because we don't have a middle school program, but we do like an intro to debate class where we kind of like talk about all the formats and stuff like that. Yeah. Like, if I was looking at these six skills and I want to like map it across a curriculum, it's about like emphasis in a rubric for me. So like we're going to do debates, right, like throughout the entirety of the course, but maybe when we're starting out, the thing that I'm looking for the most or that we focused on is case writing. So if you're looking in terms of like a graded class, like I might talk to the kids about the line by line and things of that nature, but I'm not going to like grade them on line by line before they know how to write a case. And then the next time they have a debate, I would build off of the case writing and be like, okay, now before we were answering each other's arguments, here's how you do it in like a systematic fashion. And I would do some like you know four corners activities or some practice exercises so they get used to that. Like they said this, I disagree with that argument. Here is why, you know, here's why my argument is better than theirs. Now, their next argument was this. So the next time we have a debate, right, like debate number two or whatever, now I'm looking for and I'm emphasizing the line. <coughs> and then next time we do the debate, we're building off of that with like extensions and crystallization. So it's like scaffolded in a way. They're gonna try and do all those things, like kind of every time, but you, know, you can't look for all of it all the time. Right. And so I think that. At least that's what I was getting out of that discussion. Right. right. And so, and, and so, it's just a matter of how are you emphasizing it right. and building off of it as you work through your career. And so, Adam, the way I grade it, which I stole this from Shante, uh, is that I grade my class on like a points-based system. It's like I have the activities that I think are most important that they do over a semester. Like, for example, it's, you know, you get points for attending a tournament. Right, because I feel like all of these things, if you go to a tournament, they all become, you got to do it. Uh, and then like the, act, like, the, like the learning parts, right, it's like, okay, you know, it's 200 points for a, when you write a case, right? Like you write, you write out, uh, you write out a case, you get 200 points. But it doesn't matter when you do that, it's just, you got to do that at the end, so, I mean, because middle schoolers go, okay, I got to have, a thousand points to get an A, all right? And but then I can only earn points in certain areas. Like so, for example, if you go to if you go to five tournaments, you can only earn a maximum of five hundred points, which is two hundred fifty points per tournament. So, if you went to two tournaments and that's all you did, you'd only have five hundred points. So you have like a C, uh, and so you have to do the other activities to be able to do that. And I think that that makes it that makes sense to to them. Right, because if I do this, I gotta get points to do this, and these are all things I want to do, and that's what, and I think that that makes it. You get all your activities in, and they understand why they're doing those activities. You had a question. Well, it was more or less a comment that it seems like some people in here have a pretty robust middle school program administrative support, and we started one that's extracurricular, and. Started with about 30 kids, we're up to about 90. Wow, oh, wow. Uh, but it's it's very, very light. It's one day a week for, mm -hmm. or one, one after school per week uh -huh. um, for about 10 weeks. And one of the things for schools that might feel like they can't get that middle school class is to just be creative with like plan B, plan C. And what we realized is in our school, we were offering a program that there's just not a lot in our area for middle school kids to do after school, right. especially if they don't want to do a sport. Right. And we found that there was a huge demand, kind of like you all have found with, with the date. But also, it put a tremendous amount of pressure on the other schools in our district. To do the same thing. thing. To do yeah. the same thing, because right. the parents are like, why is this high school providing an opportunity? But then we're all a part of a greater district, and it's not. And so the district then mandated that every middle school had to provide the date as an extracurricular. And so I, I really enjoy the presentation, but for people who maybe don't feel like they have the support to have a class, there are definitely still opportunities. Yeah. It's just extra work because, you know, I'm going unpaid to give up time after school that I could be using working with my high school students. 
but I think that the, the demand is clearly there. And most of the middle school uh, debate around uh, Georgia and around Atlanta is that's the way it is because it's you know teacher who is doing it now. The beauty of the Atlanta area is that we have a middle school league that everybody can join, you know, and and there are tournaments, um, you know, there are tournaments once a month. So you can, because I mean, middle schoolers, I think if they know, hey, I'm going to a tournament, I'm going to compete, they their motivation now, I mean, their motivation gets up, they like, I'm going to compete, I got a game. Um, and I think that that's the important part. And, and a lot of the team three debate are clubs. Like, I mean, they're, they're, they, you know, and I think that that works. I mean, I think that that really does work. Now, it does put a lot of pressure on uh, a person who has to do it in two places. And, and, and I guess that's why the whole trying to recruit a teacher, a middle school teacher, to be your helper there. And uh, is really important in terms of trying to provide them the resources to be helpful well, to you. I was going to add to one thing that we did in Newark uh, early on is that we, that both in terms of teaching it and in terms of parents, we made, and, and with administration, we were like, treat debate like a sport. That means that you don't expect your football coaches to work for free, right? Like, you treat it like a sport. Parents demanded that it be treated like a sport. And so debate now is kind of is treated like a sport. Like so, debate coaches are treated like track coaches, like football coaches, and we're we're expected like kids have to re have a certain GPA in order to go to tournaments, etc. So, like I would I would start to try to push the culture so that happens because I don't think because I don't think it's sustainable if it's not right. Like it's not gonna like it won't last beyond you if it's just something that you volunteer for after school. All right. Oh, well, I was trying to say about struggling to get a program for a middle school program. Like I, I've been struggling for a little bit, and I found that I think it was threaded throughout what both of you have been saying. That's leveraging parents, because when parents hear debate, they love it. They love it. Uh, like whenever I had middle school parents come to me, who are K through twelve school, and come to me and like, hey, is there a debate in middle school? And I was like, no, I don't have anything. Uh, I'm not. I'm not able to do that because of how the schedule and administration goes. But if you could let the middle school know that is something you're interested in, that'd be great. And then the next thing I know, you get an email from our middle school director, just like, we have 45 student and parents in, like signed a petition ready for debate. Uh, what are you gonna do about that? Right, exactly. <laughs> right. I mean, our, our, grades, our grade levels, are like, our, our grades are about 100 students each. So uh, that's a huge chunk of, two, uh, and there's only two grades. Uh, but now I'm starting a, you know, a continuous sort of class, but club class thing that we do. Uh, in middle school, because uh, the parents have a lot of authority, a lot of people and a lot of authority. Right. Any other questions? Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate it.